All right, let's roll. <clears throat> so I can't really watch chat while I have my, my desktop shared. So if you're asking questions in chat while I'm sharing, I, I may not see it just because it creates this really cool effect that's also disorienting. Um, uh, so, you know, I don't mind if you talk or whatever. It's, I, I know there's a limited number of, of seats, but um, uh, I'll, I'll try to check in uh, when I can. I'll volunteer to watch chat and say something if it pops up. What Rogan? Thank you. I'll let Rogan do it. I was going to say I'll let you do it, but whatever. <laughs> no, I insist. <laughs> um, all right, let me get off of this thing. So, um, we uh, we use up uh, a lot at King County um, various automated material processing and sorting devices. Um, and a couple of vendors use it as well. And it's, it's, it's a big chunk of our activity. Um, and over the years, I've developed a kind of a simmering dissatisfaction, uh, partly with just administering SIP servers and um, not so much the application, but just there's just problems with some of the implementation that, I've, that have kind of been bugging me. Um, and uh, so a while back, I started experimenting with some stuff, trying to think of how can we do this better? There's got to be a better way. Uh, and I finally settled on something that I think is going to work. And um, I got really excited and started porting all this code over. And I realized I should probably stop and talk about it uh, in case, you know, what I'm doing is insane. Um, and also, I'm hoping that the stuff I've done so far uh, could eventually, you know, potentially could become a, a community level project that um, would uh, replace the um, the SIP server implementation that we use now for Evergreen uh, and, and potentially other ILSs, if, you know, if other people wanted to use it. Uh, so I have um, on my um, surprise, surprise GitHub, we we're talking about GitHub this morning, uh, on my repositories, I have a, um, a repository here called SIP2 Mediator. Um, and there's a readme on there with a bunch of stuff in it. Uh, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about what it is and how it works and um, and then uh, kind of just take it from there. So the um, I started out with maybe three or four things that are bothering me. And then as I started working on this stuff, I, I found that there are a lot of things that could be better about the implementation. So I started trying to implement those as well as along the way. So uh, I wanted to kind of step through some of my project goals. Uh, and um, that could make kind of explain why I went the route I went. Um, so decoupling ILS implementation from the SIP server. Um, right now, the SIP server.pm uh, you know, it loads an ILS module and then calls uh, methods on that module. Um, so they're not exactly the same package, but they're pretty tightly linked. Um, I wanted to separate them out completely uh, so that you have a SIP server, which basically does no ILS logic, but it knows how to talk to an ILS on a simple level. Um, decoupling SIP accounts with ILS accounts. This has come up before. Um, I know I've talked to Jeff Godin about this many times. I think he may even have a patch running locally that does this. Um, it shouldn't be necessary to give vendors ILS account logins to use SIP. So um, part of my implementation includes having SIP accounts that are separate from ILS accounts. Um, I became very interested in a SIP API, which is separate from the SIP server. Again, going back to decoupling ILS from the SIP server. Um, and in the case of the of the code that I'm working on, I actually created a um, a SIP service, like an open source service in Evergreen that implements the SIP logic. So if, even if the SIP front end is swapped out, the back end stays the same. Um, system requirements on SIP servers has always been an issue. Uh, some steps have been taken to help with that, with the uh, the, the pre forking and the um, the different session management stuff. Um, I wanted to take it a little bit further. Uh, and I'll talk about more on the architecture in a second of that. <clears throat> I like the idea of a, a SIP server which can send requests to an Evergreen cluster um, and distribute the load across the cluster. There are ways you can do that now over XMPP, but um, it, what I'm thinking of is more at the HTTP level um, where you can just blast it across uh, a, a load balancer. Um, one of the issues I have now with SIP server is you, when you stop the server, you're essentially just sort of kicking everyone off and you don't really know what's happening. 
So um, there are times where someone could be in the middle of a, of a request and they get their, you know, get chopped off at the knees. I wanted to try to address that to the extent that I can. Uh, SIP is stateful, so it's not easy necessarily to, there, there's no way, it's, at some point you have to chop them off, but you can do it better times than others. Uh, moving the SIP config into the Evergreen database, another one that's been bugging me for a while. This one's pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, allowing config changes without having to restart the SIP server. This bugs me all the time. We're constantly adding SIP accounts for various things. And every time I do, we have to restart all of our production servers. And that just seems really unnecessary. Decoupling institution IDs from config settings. Um, <clears throat> if you have one client that wants billing details, or maybe let's say hold details as barcodes, and another one that wants hold details as titles, you have to kind of duplicate this institution chunk in the config. Um, and I thought it, may, it would make more sense to have things like that more at the um, account level or at a, at a settings group level than at the um, uh, institution level. Um, supporting uh, persistent and transient SIP sessions. Uh, this has come up in other contexts talking about authentication, just regular evergreen authentication, uh, where the idea being that you could store all sessions in the database that would last longer than um, uh, memcache, so if memcache had a restart, you could still pull the data from the database and it wouldn't kick everyone off the uh, system. I wanted to get that going on the SIP side because we do have SIP sessions uh, that will just last indefinitely. Um, and so I wanted to, uh, the ability to use memcache as a cache, but also have the data backed up in the database for sessions that last for days and days and days. Um, <clears throat> And again, I'm kind of getting ahead because I probably should have talked about the architecture a little bit first. But um, part part of the idea here is that um, the, the the SIP thing that I'm calling the SIP mediator, it uh, translates SIP requests and then posts them to HTTP HTTP backend, um, which of course can be HTTPS. Uh, so there's kind of a weird bonus here with what I'm working on, where if you were running the mediator, uh, you know, at the SIP client end, let's say um, I know. Blake has mentioned the uh, uh, the Raspberry Pi that he's using as a as a tool to keep a, a certain SIP client happy. You know, if that if that Raspberry Pi was running the mediator, it could then send the SIP request to Evergreen via HTTPS, and then you wouldn't have to do the uh, the tunneling. It would just be secure at that level. Um, that wasn't I didn't set out to do that, but that's kind of a neat side effect. Um, and that uh, uh, and part of that is just in anyone who wanted to. Could perform SIP actions directly on the ILS without having to actually talk SIP, as long as you can compose the SIP message uh, in a certain format. And then uh, another bonus that kind of came along as I was working on this is testing SIP via Surfshell. So if well, there's a SIP service, then you can just test SIP via Surfshell. Um, and I'm going to back up a little bit and explain some of this, but um, you can see here a SIP message is just JSON. So what am I even talking about? Um, I so the overall pieces of what I'm describing here, there's a thing called the mediator. And all it does is it accepts SIP connections from a client, uh, multiple. It can manage as many as necessary. And as requests come in, it serializes them as JSON and then posts them to an HTTP backend. That's all it does. And it just sits and does that on a select loop. It's not multi-threaded. It's not multi-process. Uh, but you could run more than one if you wanted to. Uh, it's it's dead simple. It's very similar to how the router works and how the uh, WebSocket D um, handler works. So it's it's dead simple. It's very fast, very efficient, um, and we don't get into any weird threading uh, issues or anything. So it um, it accepts SIP from a SIP client, JSONifies it, posts it to an HTTP server, and then what happens after that is dependent on the ILS. In the case of Evergreen, there's a small mod Perl handler that just sends. Uh, request to the Open ILS SIP service backend. Um, and then here's an example of uh, a login message SIP and then the JSON version of the same message. Um, I want to, well, I'll pause for a second there because I, I kind of just, you know, <laughs> ran through this chaotically. I didn't really have this planned out. It's just a bunch of stuff. Uh, but I'll pause for a second. I was going to look at it, some of the code and some client code running just to give a sense of uh, what it looks like at that level. Um, okay, just checking the, all right, no questions right now. 
Okay. Um, so this is the main GitHub page and if anyone's following along, I have a evergreen branch on my uh, evergreen GitHub clone. The branch is just SIP2-mediator. Um, so that's there as well. And what it does is, um, <clears throat> so here's my little evergreen VM. I have the mediator running with a bunch of flags and options. And then um, on the back end, it's going to post to, let me find the actual, it's going to post to an HTTP back end. All it does is pull out the session key and the message, does some simple checking to make sure it looks sane, and then it posts to the SIP2 API on the back end. That part's dead simple. The uh, real work happens in the SIP open dash open dash ILS dot SIP2 service. Um, and that's where you're actually compiling all the data and, excuse me, sending it back. And one thing I did, and I, I don't know if this is true for other people, but um, I, I do occasionally have to modify the SIP code to handle some custom situation on our side. And I find that the abstraction is actually a problem for me. Um, because you, you end up having to dig through multiple layers just to figure out where is the AB field, how do I, which function is being called on which server or in which you know module to return the value for the AB field. I'd rather just provide a value for the AB field and be done with it. Um, so it gets rid of some of the abstraction. Uh, and this, the, what I'm looking at right now is the um, item information handler. Um, so this is the handum idle in, item info function, and um, you know it has some internal code that pulls in all the details of the item. And then it just turns it into a JSON or a, a you know a hash of the data, which then gets JSONified and sent back. So to me, this is a lot easier to tweak and a lot easier to uh, understand since you're generally referencing SIP documentation anyway. So you're seeing AB, AH, AP, AQ, and you don't have to translate that into some um, middle uh, you know intermediary abstraction layer. Um, let's see. There's uh, just trying to find an example of <clears throat> some of the configuration stuff. Oh, there's a session class. That's right. So um, I've moved the settings in the database, as I mentioned, and it um, basically tracks SIP settings as sim very similarly to org unit settings. And um, let me just do a quick glance at some of the SIP level stuff. The database, there's a SIP account. So you have a, um, an account which has a password. Oh, it's just password, that's right. Um, password is two. So it's a new password type. Um, the uh, password type SIP2, and of course it's all just salted and good stuff, uh, but it's completely separate from the ILS login. And the way the SIP uh, works is you give it a name, doesn't matter what the username is, I called it admin because I'm lazy. And then under the covers, it's linked to an ILS account, which has the permissions needed to perform SIP activity. Um, but the um, on the vendor side, all they have is admin and a SIP login. And they, they with that, they can't log into Evergreen, they can only access the one SIP entry point uh, via the via the mediator or via the uh, SIP2 API or the open dash ILS SIP2 API. Um, so let's see. There, so there's my SIP2 other password type. Other tables in here. Um, my wife's coming home, so the dogs are probably about to bark. I have the door shut though, so hopefully it won't be bad. Be too bad. So I have the session. So I have one active session right now. It tracks a SIP specific token and then maps that to the auth token on the back end. Um, whenever we have sessions in Evergreen proper, then this will just link to a, an auth session in Evergreen. Uh, and then let's see. And then the settings should look pretty familiar. They're the same that are in the uh, oils SIP config.file or .xml file, uh, just encoded as uh, JSON, the actual values. Um, 
Okay, that's most of the schema. The um, and as far as the implementation on the back end, if I look at, whoops, where am I? Oh, wrong one. Sorry. Oh wait, no, I'm in the right spot. So it has the same kind of patron item, et cetera. I haven't ported the transaction stuff over yet, <clears throat> but um, excuse me, patron info, item info, patron status are currently supported, and it's you know it's it's doing the same thing the current SIP code does. It's it, I just brought it over, and, and if there were cases where there were it was really clear that it, some things could be optimized, I went ahead and did that. But the uh, all the logic is the same as what's in the SIP server now, and the same settings are, are, are um, honored and everything. Um, so as far as the uh, mediator goes, I mentioned I had this guy running over here. I have a different um, VM running over here. Uh, and in the package, I include a um, the mediator itself and then a SIP2 client. And this is all Perl, of course. So you can use the client as a test. And I have just something that I put together a second ago for um, called uh, that just runs five parallel SIP clients at 100 requests each. And the purpose of this was just to demonstrate that the um, mediator itself is perfectly capable of handling quite a bit of throughput. Um, so this is 500 SIP requests in a little over eight seconds, which is um, uh, a little bit short of 60 a second um, on average, which is more, I think, I think the last time I looked at ours, I went back a month or two and peaking somewhere around 40 requests a second across multiple servers. And this is just one little mediator doing it. Um, and it's making real requests. It's going back to Evergreen and pulling up I, uh, item or patron info. I forget which one it is. Um, okay, item information. So the, the point of this is simply that the mediator itself is not going to have any problem with throughput. It's like I said, it's just doing a select loop. It has very little work to do. If you watch it in top, it's running about one or 2% when I'm doing this kind of thing. Uh, all the real work happens on the ILS side. Um, <clears throat> so my thinking is with something like this, if you, you know, you'd probably want to run more than one for, um, uh, you know, availability reasons, but even just one on a machine is um, uh, minimal memory. I'll kick this off again. And um, so with five going as quickly as possible, minimal memory, minimal CPU. So um, you know, we, we have four SIP servers right now, and they're all working, you know, they're not working that hard, but they're working steadily. And um, I could probably replace all of them with a, you know, a two core little machine that runs this and then points it on the back end to the Evergreen cluster, where all of the Apache servers are running and recover, um, I don't know how many CPUs and how many gigs of RAM that we don't need to be spending. Um, so I guess that's the that's the quick blast of information. Um, and then here's the uh, install. The the uh, footprint's pretty small as far as installation prerequisites go. Uh, sample of running the mediator. Um, oh yeah, the Gradle shutdown. Um, the way it works is you send it a signal and um, it first closes the uh, server socket so that it can't accept new clients. And then it will poll for a moment when there are no in-flight requests. And as soon as it reaches a moment where there are no in-flight requests, it shuts down and disconnects all the clients. So um, it has to kick them off eventually, but at least they're not in the middle of a request before it chops them off. Um, and if you are load balancing on the back end to the main production system with multiple web servers, then you know you can pull one of those out 
and perform whatever maintenance you need on those as well without impacting SIP as a whole because it'll presumably your load balancer has been configured to ignore the one that's been taken out of production or rotation. All right, I'm going to pause again and see what's going on over here. <clears throat> Any questions at this point, but a whole lot of and you'll have a patch ready soon, right? <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll um, the, um, so I mentioned a second ago, the, the only thing that isn't implemented yet is check in, check out, and maybe one other transactional thing. Uh, but of course, most of that would just be copied over from the, the current SIP code and then taught to return data in the format that I needed to return it in. Um, and then I guess we'd probably want a, um, a uh, a repository you know on the evergreen side that has the mediator itself um so that'll be something i can i can work with galen or whoever on that uh but yeah it's close uh, and to answer jason's question yes it eliminates the need for the sip server i mean you still have a sip server but you don't have to use the sip server.pm package anymore or the um open ILS source paramods uh sip stuff that'll all eventually go away and the logic that was there will be translated over into the open dash ILS.sip2 service. Jason anticipated well, my question there. Well, uh, the mediator, well, uh, uh, most of it would be. The only part that's not is um, the mediator proper. And the reason for that is it has no ILS logic at all. And I think that it could be used for something like Koha or anyone else who wants to use it. Um, you all you have to do is implement the the proper HUDB backend in the mediator itself. Um, my preference would be that it stand alone for that reason. Yeah, Koha uses its own internal SIP at this point. So yeah, I know they're yeah. they're using a variation of SIP server.pm from what I recall. They've pulled it into Koha proper. So right, and part of that is because SIP server itself does so much ILS logic. The mediator does nothing. It's just a JSON translator. Yeah. Um, so it, it it seems to me like something that could be more more readily used by a different system. Because you don't have to there's no reason to modify it. how can we help i'm sorry i just <laughs> totally <laughs> muted myself um i don't know why i'm just used to doing that i don't know how much of that you even heard me saying um uh the uh i'm gonna just to back up real quickly to jason's comment about um why not just rolling it into evergreen did you hear any of that the beginning of it you dropped off part way through okay sorry um the part of the reason uh, SIP was rolled into Koha is because the SIP server PM application does so much logic of its own. Uh, so it makes sense for it made sense for them to pull it in so they could tweak it without having to post it back to a shared uh, community project, I'm guessing. Uh, whereas the mediator itself does absolutely nothing except translate SIP into JSON and post it. And um, so there's very little need to have to modify the mediator itself. So to me, it makes more sense to be a standalone thing that anyone can use and, you know, rarely gets touched in any way. Uh, yes, somewhere between the um and the um, 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 um. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it's been a while since I've done public speaking. Uh, so that was the idea behind keeping it separate because I don't think you would need to absorb it and make a lot of local modifications. It should just be a standalone thing. The, um, Another side effect of this, which I sort of mentioned, but I think is kind of worth uh, reiterating is because we have the open ILS SIP service, uh, you could, and SIP itself is, um, it's, it's very widely used, uh, not because of the SIP wire protocol, but because it's a, just a dead simple messaging protocol. It, people know what the fields mean. There's not that many of them. It's, it's widely adopted, so it just kind of gets more widely adopted. But uh, you could just as easily uh, you know, work with a vendor to 
instead of using SIP and connecting to a SIP server, just ask them to connect to an HTTP backend. And instead of sending SIP, send a JSON form of the same SIP message that follows this basic pattern. Uh, and then, you know, I think there are cases there where we could sort of move away from the wire level protocol entirely. Not everyone, of course, but um, some vendors might think that's easier and you get SSL free or TLS or whatever. Um, so there's kind of an interesting thing there that could open up a way to get off of the wire level stuff while maintaining the fields we all know and love. So a couple of implementation questions from Mike. One, could we replace the mod pro handler with a mode that can just talk to the translator or gateway? And two, can we make the session table unlogged, presumably to avoid wall issues and stuff? <laughs> um, yeah, we could. Um, the, the point of the, uh, of the mod Perl handler goes back to the ILS agnostic uh, approach um, so that it's just doing the message itself and then a session key and not having to learn about Evergreen so that other ILSs could potentially take advantage of it. Uh, and to answer your question of the um, making the session table unlogged, I added a, um, I may have glanced over it here, but um, let's see, where is that? The SIP account table has a transient flag. Um, and I, I understand where you're coming from, Mike. We, you guys may do this too, but we have um, our SIPs are load balanced and the load balancer sends every second a login request to every SIP server. Um, and I wouldn't want to track those sessions. So if a client is configured as transient, then those, those connections won't be logged. So if you know the client always logs in, requests one piece of information that logs off, you can make it transient. It doesn't have to go in the session table, but if you know it's long lived, you can make it non-transient and then it will go in the session table. <clears throat> okay, a little further up, how can we help? Um, I, uh, so there's a little bit of the implementation back in, and a, a, a testing is gonna be the main thing, really. Uh, I gotta finish porting the transaction stuff over. I need to, move the SIP mediator presumably to a to an evergreen dash you know a git.evergreen-ios.org repository um uh but really testing is going to be the 99 percent of what i can use what i what i need help wise <clears throat> yeah, Mike, I, I, I don't fully recall the um, the URL template that you're describing, but I'm sure there's I'm sure there's a way to to do that, um, uh, where we sort of tweak it so that it can talk directly to the back end, and then that's some kind of configurable thing that happens in the mediator. Right, gotcha. Uh, if anyone, uh, the, again, the code's over here. Um, if you write SIP client stuff, the, the client's here, and you can um, do a fair amount of stuff with that, and it'll, it'll do things where it logs um, more sort of, let's see friendly messages where you can diagnose, um, you can better break apart the output of what's going on. Um, so you can, you can print out um, this kind of layout and it is localizable in fact, although I've never, I haven't made any translations or anything. So yeah, I'll I'll um I'll get a bug up on launchpad. Uh 
yes, Jeff, <laughs> this was very much inspired by PySIP2. And I came very close to writing a Python SIP server and then thought that that was probably not a good idea, especially as how we're in the middle of removing all the Python from Evergreen. Um, I thought that I should probably do something that's actually a little bit more maintainable uh, and adoptable if I want anyone besides me to use it. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. I'll get some Launchpad stuff up and um, yeah, take it from there.